Just ask the Savior to help you. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Our sermon text this morning is from our Old Testament lesson, Genesis chapter 3. And I'd like to read again verses 1 through 5. Now the serpent was more crafty, or some translations read clever, than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat of any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. This is our text. That is great. Gracious God, we come again today with humble and thankful hearts. We are humbled in your presence, God, because we know that there is nothing that we have done or do that merits our ability to come to you. And yet, God, you invite us into your presence. You come to where we are. You cover us with your grace and your mercy. And you empower us to live as your sons and daughters. And for that, we give you thanks. I pray, God, now that the words of my mouth, the meditation of our collective hearts, would indeed be acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength, and you are our redeemer. Amen. Amen. I understand that there is a person from this community of our history whose name was Walt Grandy. I understand that he was somewhat of a clever individual. Crafty, smart, perhaps. But something happened somewhere in his life that things changed. And he ended up not having a home, living in his car. One of the local books says that a cardboard box was his home for a little while. Some things that happened in his life that perhaps weren't as clever or as crafty as they could have been. He ended up doing some things and engaging in activities that may not have been as clever as one would have thought. And he died alone. I imagine that that's not the way that he anticipated his life going. I just imagine that that's not what his parents would have wanted for him. Things change. Have you ever known someone who ended up in a place where you didn't expect them to end up? Have you ever found yourself going in a direction that you didn't expect to be going in yourself? When we hear the creation story, when we read the story about the Garden of Eden, as we have this morning, when we hear about the creation of man and woman, Adam and Eve, do we expect, as we read the story, we all know the story well, but think about the beginning of the story, do you expect them to be banned from the garden that God gave them. To be exiled, kicked out of the paradise that God placed them in. Has life ever disappointed you? Have people ever disappointed you? Has a teacher ever disappointed you? Has the church ever disappointed you? Today I want to suggest for just a few moments that when we lose focus of who we are as the children of God, when we forget the parameters, the guidelines that God has set for us, when we operate, if you will, in our own mind to set, life will disappoint us. And we find ourselves in this lesson today moving from being clever or crafty to being cursed can find ourselves moving from good to bad, from happy to sad. We begin this first Sunday of Lent 
As we do every first Sunday of Lent with the story of what some is commonly referred to as the story of the fall of mankind. Some would suggest that this is when sin first entered into the world. But you know, as we look at the text, we discover that disobedience, that sin, the desire to be clever or crafty, and the danger of being cursed was and is always present in our lives. Amen. So today as God moves through us, we're going to see ourselves move from clever to curse to cover. In the context of Genesis 3, we are reminded of the great work that God has done. What has God done? God has created the world. There was chaos in the beginning. And in that chaos, God stepped from the very beginning. There was the capability of destruction and darkness and chaos. So we ought not be surprised when things go wrong or awry in our lives. Chaos has been here from the beginning of time. It was dark. There was chaos. That's what the Bible says. And what happened to the darkness? What happened to the deep? What happened to the chaos? God happened to it. God stepped into the darkness. God stepped into the chaos. And God started moving things around. Amen. So let's just hang out there for just a moment. In the beginning, before anything was, it is in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of the darkness, in the midst of the deep, God showed up and God began to work. I just want you to hear about your God, my God, our God, the God that we serve. He is not, thanks be to God, unfamiliar with chaos. So there cannot be too much chaos in your life that God cannot handle. Our Lenten journey invites us to seek God in the midst of our chaos. The Lenten journey invites us to seek the power of God in the darkness of our lives. For Jesus declares, I am the light of the world. He will light up your life. He will brighten your day. He's able to turn darkness right into day. It doesn't matter how dark the day gets, how long the night, how difficult the experience, God will show up. God will enlighten. God will separate. God will make a way. In the beginning, God stepped into the darkness and the chaos. And God gave the darkness and the chaos some parameters, some, some borders. What did he do? He separated the day and the night. He separated the dry land from the seas. He established some parameters because God, he can do that. He's not afraid of the dark. He's not afraid of the deep. He's not afraid of the chaos. He stepped out into them and he put them in their place. God can do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. God can change the order of our lives. God can put things in the proper perspective and in the proper places for us. And God desires. To do just that. God desires to put our lives in the proper place. God desires to order our steps. God desires to give us what we need and show us how to live good lives. So we sing, yield not to temptation. He, he knows what we need. He will give us what we need. He will show us his way. That's his desire. That's his desire. But unfortunately, regardless of what we say or sing, we're not always open to God ordering our lives. We are not always open to God setting the parameters, the borders for us. Because sometimes we think we're a little more crafty. 
a little more clever, if you will, than God. Now, don't think that I am knocking being crafty or clever. This text is not downplaying the importance of asking questions and seeking understanding. We encourage inquisitive minds. We encourage asking questions. I appreciate the questions you ask me in and out of Bible class, even the ones that I don't know the answer to and I have to try to figure it out and go do some study. We all ought to want to grow in our understanding of what the Word of God says to us. We all ought to want to grow in the knowledge of the world around us, who we are and where we are. The more we learn, the better we are. Amen. The more you know about who you are, the more you know about where you live and where you have come from, the better off you will be. Knowledge is powerful. I watched a YouTube, yes, I get caught up in YouTube as well. And I watched a YouTube about a young man who knew his rights. He had been stopped by a police officer and was being asked to do something that, that he didn't really have to do. So he respectfully, so hear me now, he respectfully, respectfully shared his rights. He was respectful. He was calm. He asked the right questions. He followed protocol. And the officer respected his right. And there was no issue. And things went on well. It pays to know your rights. It pays to know when and how to use your knowledge as well. The Bible says that the serpent was crafty or the most clever of all of God's creation. The serpent, what we call snake, was what? The craftiest, the cleverest of God's creation. So we just got to pause here and understand something about the serpent, the snake. The snake was not an evil creature. We, some of us, me included, have unfairly judged the snake. The snake is a creation of God. The most clever of his creation, the Bible says. The lesson from that is that sometimes we have to remember that we judge things and we judge people by what we think we know and by not what is fact. You might think you know something about someone. You might think you know why someone acts the way they do. You might think you know how someone's life is going to turn out, but you cannot know what their future is or what God has for them, so judge not. I just wonder if there's anybody in the house today who has done more than what somebody expected you to do. I wonder if there's anybody in the house today who has seen more than you ever expected to see. I am so glad that we are created in the image of God and God has the final say. Amen. And God has a good plan and God desires good for us. And when God's plan is worked out in our lives, when we submit to his will and his way, great things can happen to us. When we submit to God's plan, when, when we submit to his call, life changes and there is nothing like the will of God going viral, if you will, taking off in our lives. The serpent was the most clever of God's creation. But something happened. Something went awry. The smart reptile created by God started instigating something. For whatever reason, this animal began to cross the line. This clever animal began to question the parameters that God had set. This clever animal does not want to follow the rules anymore. This is a creation of God. This is a clever creation of God. This is a gifted creation of God in the place that God created. Paradise. This gifted creation of God in this good place called paradise 
in a place where the chaos and the darkness and the confusion has been handled, this gifted creation of God is in a safe and a good place. This gifted creation of God is in a place where his needs are being met. Adam and Eve are in the same place. It's a good place. Their needs are being met. It's paradise. They do have to work. Yes, they were stewards of the land. They were tillers of the land. They had the job of taking care of what God had given to them. But it was a good place. The work was good. The work was productive. They got more than a living wage. The gardening, Mike, was good. The corn was sweet. The tomatoes were free of blight. There was an irrigation system in the place. Two rivers came together in that place that watered the garden. The crops were abundant. They had what they needed within the boundaries that God had set for them. Yes, there were some boundaries. You got all of this. Enjoy it. Plenty. But that one, don't touch. The one in the middle of the garden, you got plenty. You got enough work to do. You got enough harvesting to do. You got what you need, so do not touch, bother that one in the middle of the garden, God says. Just leave it alone. Stay away from it. Be obedient. Stay in the place, God says, that I have set for you. It's all good. God has a place for all of us. God has a work for all of us. And when we stay in the place that God has created for us, life is good. Amen. It's when we step outside the boundaries that God has given to us that life gets messy. When we are envious of what somebody else has and we try to get it, life gets messy. When we think we got to have what someone else has instead of what God has for us, life gets messy. But when we think we know better than somebody else and we start talking about them, life gets messy. When we think that the rules apply to everybody else, but they don't apply to us, life gets difficult and messy. Most of us, if not all of us, have moments in our lives when we don't think we have to abide by all the rules. There's something exciting. Whether we want to admit it or not, there's something exciting about being able to have it our way, to do it our way, to bend, to break the rules. So the other day I was reviewing my Groupons. You know what Groupons are? Groupons are internet coupons. I got an internet coupon. Guys, I'll tell you about this later on. It's called to the alpha male. I got something done to my fingers and my feet, but I'll tell you all about that later. <laughs> but, but anyway, I was reviewing the Groupons, and I found one that I really got excited about. What do you think it was about? <laughs> Without a doubt, it was about driving a classic muscle car. Listen to and it was 50% off. I had to go back and look at the copyright. Tell nobody yet, but I can keep going back and looking at it. Listen to the description of this Groupon deal. This is straight out of the ad. Driving really fast is illegal. Unless you're on a racetrack or in New Hampshire during one of the state's no law Wednesdays. Live free! and drive with this Groupon. That's how come I keep going back to look at it over and over and over again. I'm intrigued. I get to drive really fast. I get to break the law and not get accused of breaking the law. The point that I'm making is the desire to drive really fast, to, to have a no law day, to do what I want to do is deep inside of me. And whether you're willing to admit it or not, it's deep inside of you too. It might not be to drive a car fast, but there is something there. The desire to do what we want to do, to have a no law day, is deep inside of us, and that clever animal knew it. 
So he slid up to Eve. Probably walked up to Eve, but at that point he was just sliding on the ground. And he approached her. Not just her. Because Adam was there. God made Eve because she said, it's not good for man to be alone. So they were together. And if you read on in the Bible, it shares with you. Whenever Eve took the bite, what did she do? She gave some to Adam, who was where? Who was with her? Brothers, he was right. We were right there. We were watching the whole thing. We saw what was going on. He was present. He was silent. He didn't say anything. He was a silent and a present participator in the whole experience. She took of his fruit, and as she took of his fruit, what should he have said? Hold up, baby, don't do that. No, don't do that. God told me before he created you not to bother that, but I know the deal. He should hold up, baby, I can't let you do that. I can't let you take a bite of that. That's the wrong thing to do. I know what they did, but he just stood there. And did not say a word. He let her take the bite, and when she said, ask him, he said, thank you. <laughs> because he wanted a no law day as well. And at that point, the serpent, the most clever animal and mankind, fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God, experienced the consequences of their actions. The curse of God was placed upon them. That's rough. <coughs> and God knew it. And God knows us. And God loves us. We are the creation of God. Mankind crossed the line, pushed the parameters, did his own thing. And God came. In the cool of the day, God showed up. In the midst of that mess, God showed up. Mankind realized his nakedness and God clothed him and her. And he tried. They got some fig leaves or some leaves or something and, and sewed them together, put them together some kind of way, and then wore them, tried to wear them, but can you imagine? It didn't work. They tried to cover up, but the leaves wilted. They didn't last. They did the best they could. But the best they could just wasn't good enough. God knows the best that we can do is just not good enough. God knows that as clever as we are, our cleverness too often leads us away from the rules that God has established for our good. So Jesus comes to us. <clears throat> He experiences the temptations of the world. He knows, he knows, he knows our story. He knows our pain. He knows our darkness. He knows our chaos. He knows our deep. He knows our challenges. He knows our shortcomings. He experienced the curse of the cross for us. And then he clothes us. He covers us. Not with fig leaves, not with animal skin, but he clothes us with what? His righteousness. He clothes us with his peace and his forgiveness and his power. We are clever. Our sin is, our disobedience is cursed. But now, thanks be to God, Jesus has paid the price. He has given his life. He has clothed us with his righteousness. And we are journeying with him again to the cross and the empty tomb where we will hear the angel declare, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He is alive. He is our peace. He is our forgiveness. He's got us covered. We were clever. Our sin is cursed. And thanks be to God, we are covered, clothed in the righteousness of Jesus forever.
Amen. 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 Amen.